It's good morning for most of you, although I'm wondering, we probably have a lot of international guests again today. You're able to connect and get online. We were so pleased to have such a large gathering at our last webinar. And so welcome to each of you, happy to be back. Wednesday, we talked about the Beethoven Adagio from the standpoint of musical form. And today we're gonna to look at the same piece, the Adagio from the Pathetique, but look at it through the lens of melody and harmony. Form, of course, the musical form, we were looking at the architecture, the, the scope of the piece, the sections, and how we looked into the new and the familiar. How do we move into new episodes and then return to what was familiar and comfortable? So, of course, involved in that architecture is the recurrence of themes. When we look at melody and harmony, <clears throat> we're really tightening in a bit, aren't we? Because we're moving into the individual section and we're looking at shape and context, shape and context. <clears throat> when I say we're zeroing in, we do have to be careful, though, that even though we're looking into the immediacy of the notes here in a short, smaller context, we have to be careful that we don't get caught up in the weeds. Now, by weeds, what I'm saying is that sometimes, especially with students, we can get so occupied with all of the notes that they can't look a little more broadly to find the context, not just with harmony, but the context of the melody in the longer line. Let's take a little look here at the score. You probably have your PDF and I'm going to share a score here with you now for a quick peek. Here's our <clears throat> A section. And when we look at the score, we're noticing right away, we see all these 16th notes. Now, granted, as professionals, we probably see right away that slur and the up step. So in some ways to us, when we played a lot of pieces from professional perspective, we see a melody and we see a bass line and we see that profiling as almost as a duet and the undulating eighth notes we just see that as a context to help elucidate the harmony so that's a professional view on it but i'm sure we've all come across the situation when our students look at this that they get caught up right away with those 16th notes and working note to note to note that's kind of uh, reminds me of a little experience I had, and I don't mean to be derogatory to this individual pianist, but we were, I was a high school student and, and hanging out with another high school pianist. And I said, well, what repertoire are you working on? And this individual said, well, I'm doing the E major Chopin A2. And I said, okay, so that's the one that goes to And the pianist said, no, it's the one that goes in other words, because it has all these other notes, that individual didn't come out of the weed, so to speak, and catch the longer line. So if we look at our Beethoven here, it's a little bit like saying, what we want to say is the melody goes to da, da, di, da, di, right? But the amateur, may approach this and say, it goes wobble, wobble, wobble. It's a little bit like uh, the Beatles, you know, hey, Joe. It's like instead of catching the melody, I'm not thinking of it as So what we have to do is always differentiate and isolate the melody. We bring the melody into the four. Yeah, one more analogy on that would be, can you imagine if you're the accompanying pianist? And you have a little accompaniment pattern. But the melody, the singer, is soaring above that. Can you imagine if the pianist just takes over like a piano concerto with a wobble, wobble background accompaniment? And these, of course, are obvious to us as professionals, but as always, we have to put ourselves in the mind of the student. So who are we coaching? How do they see it? And we need to coach them into the long line, coach them into the full context and meaning of what's happening. And we'll be surprised too, because even ourselves, no matter how many pieces we play, often we can get too caught up in the weeds ourselves and not giving more understanding to that broader context. With that in mind, let's dig in and explore more 
and melody and harmony. I wanted to talk a little bit about for differentiating melody from accompaniment, melody from harmony, then sometimes we miss the fact that melody can be derived from the harmony. Does that kind of make some sense? Sometimes maybe in thinking of a songwriter or whatever, we're going to sing and play a melody, and then we're going to say, well, what fits the melody? What chords can we tack on to just give that a little vibrant accompaniment? But it doesn't really work that way. We get a beautiful integration between the melody and the context. Let's just see if we can take some examples. Uh, so what do we have? That was five, one, right? The fifth to the root of the chord, to the third, to the fifth, and back to the third. So there's this complete outline of the major tonic triad. And then what? We go to the five chord. And right there, all of the chord tones of the five chord. So that melody has actually outlined our chords. There's all our chord tones, right? So... outline. So we're seeing that we have this need to differentiate our melody, but at the same time, we want to integrate it with the harmony. So we want to separate it out, you might say, by bringing our harmony very soft and project our melody. So we not just separate it, but we relate the melody to the chord tones. That's outlining our chord tones of the one chord, isn't it? So our melody derives from the harmony that's underneath, relates to it, and yet soars and differentiates above. That's, I guess, if you will, the calculus of music, where we we differentiate and we integrate. And just like a calculus differential equations, integrals, there's the two ways of looking at it that in a way can be separate, but there's more meaning in seeing how they come together. Let's dig in then uh, to our piece here. I'm gonna just bring up the score again briefly. <clears throat> so what's our first look when we dig into the score. Of course, one can't help but just start getting right in there and say, okay, I've got an A flat chord. I want to start blocking this out or at least find the melody, right? Let's just keep going a minute and find our melody. Okay, so we find that, but what does our student need to do first? We don't want to just jump in because if we jump in without thinking, we've got, we've got 88 keys here to deal with on the keyboard. But if we take just a moment, just a moment and take in that key signature, what does that do for us? For some, it may confuse, right? The student may feel confused by that key signature, but no, it's a simplifying because it took the 88 keys and reduced it just down to the seven tones. So let's get our scale in mind. First thing we do is we say, okay, it's A flat. So maybe put an octave down here and let's put the fifth here. So we have scale step five, one and five, tonic and dominant. And we know with black key scales, our thumb will fall on C and F. So we've got our four fingers coming up from F, three up from the C. And it just repeats across the keyboard. Leading tone. So that leading tone would be important. Isolated one, five, and leading tone. And how about the third of the chord? 
maybe we can invert our, our uh, and if the students pretty good, maybe we can invert our five, seven. Okay, so we're getting warmed up, aren't we? We're getting oriented. A couple thoughts on these black keys. I mentioned our scale fingering is always thumb on the C and the F for that right hand. Does that mean we can't put the thumb on a black key? Sometimes students carry that little old adage with them. And of course we can do we can, we can often have the thumb on, on black keys, but not when it passes under, since that of course is gonna be problematic. But just like five is short, so he doesn't really want to go on black keys either, but we just slide in. And the five was just fine on those black keys. So it doesn't matter. Get into the woods, get into the feel, and move through those scale tones. So sometimes you might want to think this. Notice what I did is I went through the scale tones, and I'm not worrying about fingering a thumb on a lot of bottom notes here. But now I'm starting to see the scale a little differently because I'm not just relating it going up, but I'm relating a couple of tones together. So what I'd like to do is have the student do these triplets and also the alternating in thirds, just a way to really get to know that scale well. And of course the highlights on the root third and the fifth, particularly the tonic and dominant one and five and our leading tone. Okay, so that's giving us a good orientation. Now I think what we need to do is we need to play our melody, don't we? But not just from reading notes, but let's read it within the scale. So our melody here, what are the chord tones we just did there? one chord, don't we? The A flat chord, so we're on the step three of the scale, three, briefly down to two, and up to where? Five. So we think of a root third fifth of the one chord, or steps one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. We're going from scale step three, and then to the five, and then back to three, and five. Okay, it's a couple things come to my mind. I don't know about yours, but I'm hearing the one chord here with that nice calm third, beauty, beautiful sound there. And then it veers away slightly, but it's on its way to step five, right? The dominant. We know tonic's important, but we got tonic covered. That's in our bass. So instead we give a rich harmony of that caring third, if you will to five, and then we're gonna just settle it back down the third again, and again to five. But notice what Beethoven did so well. It was from three to five, but instead of walking up there, if I was writing, I probably would have done this. In other words, you kind of tend to just walk right there, the most direct path, but isn't this more beautiful? going away and coming to five. Okay, then if he was going to repeat it, that might be boring. He does the same thing though. He comes down and again it's three and then the two to five. So it's the same B flat D. E. Three, two, five. Three, two, five. So he approaches it from underneath and then from above, and beautifully walking through the chord tones of the one chord to get there. So if we look at more of a macro sense of this melody, we've got the third to the fifth, right? And then again, the third to the fifth. And then he moves into the more extension, moves away. So we have the simplicity 
from that opening phrase, and yet there's a complexity of what goes on underneath. Are you ready to take a little deep look into what goes underneath? It's not so hard, really. We know our one and five, seven, don't we? If we gave them names, what would the chord names be? A flat, and then step five, E flat, seven. So A flat, E flat, seven. And we see here, ah, yes, we have the one chord. And it's, here's the five, seven. It's just a little unusual in that there are five chords here. You put the seventh in the bass, which resolves to the middle of the one. So it's, and then it does it again, but it'll be the third coming here. Ah, uh, that's interesting, isn't it? It's one to five, seven, and one to five, seven, and one, so it's just back and forth between those two chords. If we could be five, seven, one, and five, seven. But that doesn't sound the greatest, does it? selective in that bass and the voicing, but it is nonetheless just those two chords, one, five, seven, one, five, seven, just like we learned back in level 2A. So when we see that simplicity, it helps us out because it's like a, um, it's like a pushing in and, and, and a pulling out and a pushing in and a pulling out, or sometimes the analogy I like to use with students is that have you ever played an accordion or I mean, excuse me, a harmonica? You put that harmonica in your mouth and when you blow out, you do the one chord, then you suck the air in. You get the five, seven, you blow out again, it's one. So it's that one and then the five, seven, and the one and the five, seven, and the one. And then he goes off just a little bit from there, doesn't he? But not very far. He's just right there. We are at our five, aren't we? It's just that he took the seventh out to be a nice five chord. So basically, this is one and one and one and five. Okay, that's it's kind of like a happy birthday. Just In other words, there's a long stretch of our chords. A long stretch of one. circle of fifths at the end. But my point here is that if we extrapolate, extend the macro essence of the chords, we see that this is basically all an extrapolation of one. And then he, here he goes to the dominant. Then he adds a little more attention with the seventh of the dominant. And then basically steps on down. Okay, that's not what he wrote. But it gives us the simplicity, and that simplicity will guide our ear. Because now we'll play that opening and understand that it's an undulation of one and five, one and five. We can bring that simplicity out, but highlight what's really important. And that's as my melody goes down here, my bass comes up. And then my melody goes up, my bass comes down. So we get this wonderful contrary motion as we talk about with our young kids also, isn't it? And that kind of squeezes us in here and then pulls back out again. And then pulling contrary motion again. All right, that's wonderful. And what's happening in that bass? We're going to the step four, which is the seventh of the five, seven. So that's going to pull down a half step, isn't it? Then the leading tone, which is going to pull up a half a step. And if you were part of the webinar we did uh, last week or a week and a half ago, we talked about scales and how that scale divides into that top part of the scale, leading tone coming down to step four, all whole steps. And what's interesting about that is it isolates and projects for us that half step resolution of the leading tone and the half step resolution of four down to step three. And that's exactly what we have here. And those will pull in and resolve upside down either way. 
lifting. Now with that in our ears and hearing the beauty of the contrary motion, but the simplicity of this extrapolation of one, we're just giving the passing chords of five, we get its essence. of the main theme. Okay, we looked at the first part of the melody, then the... And then what happens next? He pulls half step up to here. Yum. Then a step down. Step down. And if you hear it as this... Is a stepping down of the melody, isn't it? And it's harmonized around the circle of fifths, where we get this F to the B flat, to the E flat, to the one. So down a fifth, everybody would have it. We'll talk about that a little bit later. We'll come back to it. But it's that F down a fifth to the two chord, the B flat minor, and the down a fifth, the E flat seven or five and or one. Very common cadence. And that cadence, the reason it works so well is because every other chord down a fifth is a step down in our scale. So that's why we get this wonderful walking, a walking down every other row, every other chord, excuse me, takes us down a step. So it's wonderful for harmonizing the emotive and sequences in the Baroque music. It's wonderful treatment here of our motives as well. Let's dive, open up to a few uh, questions. I'm going to, um, boy, I've been having my screen on there. I'm talking without you seeing me, I apologize. Uh, comments. I see someone saying this makes sense. Good. That's a lot happier to hear than if someone was saying this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> what do we have here? Randy, I think what we could do is um, we've got a lot of wonderful comments here in the chat thread. We've also got, if you go to your attendees, Mm -hmm. You see there's a hand raised. So we've got a hand raised from Marguerite. I remember she had her hand raised yesterday and I don't think we had time. Oh, right. I think I remember seeing Why Marguerite invite her on? there last the, the other day. Marguerite, would you come on? Let's see here. Oh, here we go. I'm gonna... Hello. It's working. It's a All miracle. Right. I apologize in advance because I get warnings that the internet is very unstable. So if you lose yeah, me, I that's... I apologize uh, for that too. I think we've just simply overwhelmed the server. Yeah. We're on a massive server, but they had a huge outage today. So yeah. that's what happens when we're all in quarantine, I guess. Exactly. I have a question, Randall, about the phrasing in the, I notice all, I, I'm all, always puzzled with the phrasing that Beethoven put in the first bars, because I also notice when you play the melody, I always feel it, if I would sing it, it's like one big slur. Yes. And especially when you come from a measure three to measure four, the slur is ending at the end of uh, measure three. But I notice when you play it, it also feels as if the E flat in the in the next measure should be in the slur as well. And I also have the same feeling with the B flat in the in the second half of the fifth measure. I also feel it should be in the slur after the after the F. Yeah, you could even take the left hand in that same spot. Beethoven has the down an octave and the down a step and an octave and the slur ends and it's new. Mm -hmm. But don't we want that D flat to pull to the C? So your point, your question is a very good one. This comes up often to me in Beethoven because sometimes I think, what is he, what did he do that? Why are we breaking and segmenting mm -hmm. 
and it, there's a little push-pull because on the one hand, we want to acknowledge the internal shapes and do the articulations in the classical period the way the composer wrote. But also, we have an obligation to convey the long line. And if we did the phrasing exactly as written, as um, this sort of a mode here, and then there's a break just at the wrong time, and then another break. Those, even if we do it eloquently, there's too much of a hiccup in the connect, and then a break. And I'm catching there your question, I believe, right? In terms of how the slurs were in, in the Bright Cup and Hartle edition. It's interesting, in a lot of subsequent editions, editors have marked dotted slurs right over those very spots you indicated to say, no, this, uh, this resolves here. So we want to keep the line going. Yeah. To me, I resolve this in my mind by thinking that Beethoven remembered pianists, yes, but he also played uh, viola. And so often he'd think in terms of string bowings. Mm -hmm. And you can change a bow, but without necessarily breaking legato. And so if you think of this um, sometimes as either motific groupings, like I've got my sound here, those two chords, and now my next phrase. And then the next here. And that's a legitimate one where I think we can take a little fresh air break, so to speak. But I would never hesitate to bring in over legato, over top the violin slur, if it enhances our melodic shaping. Okay. What I often sometimes explore is catching it in the pedal, but letting my hand breathe a little bit and see if that slurring will make sense. But mm -hmm. I do feel like it's important to sometimes just as we do with the Clementi or whatever, we, we're going to subordinate the articulation to the overall line. Doesn't mean we discard the articulation. It's still um, articulated, but the shaping goes beyond those articulations. And with that in mind here, we're going to go beyond just the slurs that are happen to be written in from the composer and think of the longer lines. Does that yeah. give some resolution yes, in your mind? Yes, it does. Yeah. Yeah, it's a Thank really you. excellent, excellent question. And I think editors have struggled with it. That's why so many have marked up a score like this, not wanting to take out Beethoven slurs, but dotted line slurs over that. Mm -hmm. And for our teaching and our professional playing, knowing that the context of that longer line is really the most important part of making the melodies shape and really work. Yeah. Uh, hey, do we have, uh, yeah, thank you, Marguerite. Good to see you. Wonderful. That was a great question. And Randy, that's such a wonderful explanation that you offered. Um, I wonder if it would be a good time for anybody else. Anybody else want to raise their hand and join us? Or ask a question? You don't have to come on live like Marguerite, although that was really cool. <laughs> I tell you, while you're thinking of more questions, let me just share a few thoughts. Um, Okay, we've identified this as three to five and back to three, coming up the chord tones and back to five. Do you think we could transpose that? Especially if we thought of this as one, as this is one, five, seven, one, five, seven, and one, and five. Let's move it to C. So we have the third of the scale. One, three, then to five. And then we get one, and then, and then around the circle like this. What do we have at the end? Still the five seven has a big multi-tone appoggiatura hanging over top our one. But notice transposing to C, understanding those scale pitches and the simplicity of the harmony makes it a doable exercise. And then, yeah, we could take it to a lot of keys from there, can we? And then half step and so forth. So do explore that. To me, what happens often, I'm so aware of how the brain can take shortcuts. And by doing shortcuts, it makes it more difficult. In other words, 
if we just plow through this piece without a lot of deep thinking, deep analysis, we can get it in our fingers. We have to remember so many notes. But if we take the time to say, what is the essence of this? What's the simplicity here? And then transpose it, you can come back to the piece later and you'll have, you'll retain that framework. And of course, if you do get lost and you're, in, and you're just lost, through because you understand the harmonies, the progression, the scale, and so on. So it's a real safeguard. Tools for improvisation, yes, safeguard for memory, but it gives anchor points of deep understanding. And probably the most important thing is when we see the simplicity, then we can play the melody more profoundly because the profound expression doesn't come from the complexity. It comes from seeing the simplicity. That's a hugely important concept. Randy, that's great. We've got another question here that was submitted through the Q&A box. Uh, this is Jerry wanting to know if you can review the progression of fifths in measure five to seven with chord analysis. One, two, three, four, five. I'd be happy to. The, um, we ended, you know, we ended on the five on that first phrase, right? And this is the five chord. This first chord, right, where you're starting out at measure five, is a little lush, isn't it? And it, it looks a little complex, but it's such a beautiful chord. It's just the E flat, the five, seven chord, but the seventh is in the bass, and he stretches the ninth over the top. So we've got just a little more stretch, and then it resolves to the one chord, but my third is in the bass. Okay, so now take that third in the bass, the C, and go down a fifth. What's down a fifth? F, down a fifth. B flat, down a fifth, E flat, and down a fifth, one. So there's a little jump from this stretch chord here to resolve that bass down that half step, right? A step four resolves to the three. And from there, we would normally go to the six chord, two, five, one, six, two, five, one. But Beethoven, where did he do a little more elegance? We have this. Uh, sorry, we're going down. Then our C, and then here a natural, which pulls to the B flat here, the root of the next chord. So instead of F minor in our key, the A natural makes it a dominant seven, a secondary dominant. F seven is five of what? F7, five of B flat, so it's five of the two. So what would have been the six is now a dominant seventh on that six scale degree. That's your five of our two, and then the five, seven, and the one. Does that help? I would imagine so. We've, uh, we've got another uh, follow-up question about harmony, and this is from Helene, who I think was on the line with us yet, or on Wednesday. Helene wants to know if you can talk about the chords in measure three. One, two, three. One. Here's the second measure. Ah, oh, good point. I had mentioned that this goes up to one chord, but maybe that's what Beethoven heard initially, but as he flushes it out, especially at a slow tempo, these are not fast eighth notes. This is a lot of time on each one. So why not harmonize each separately? So this third is just like the opening. We're under one chord. But then where do we go here? There's our five chord, isn't it? We just have the G in the bass. The third in the bass is still angry down here on five. So we go one, five. And that's our F minor. That's our, it's the sixth chord in our key. <clears throat> but what he's doing here, we have to see where he's going. He's headed to E flat, right? Do you remember how in our sonatinas we modulate to the five? So we're in the key of A flat here. It makes sense that we're gonna to go to the E flat in some theme, right? And what's the five of E flat? B7. So a B7 is the five of the five. And so as he walks through this, this is the two and the five and a one in the key of E flat. So what happens is that F minor, Though it's a six chord in our key, it actually becomes a two, 
nine, one of the E flat of the five. This is a little bit like a jazz chord in a way. The two, five, one. I know that sounds rather complex, but if we move this to C, we maybe will see it more easily. Shall we do that? We have C major, right? Then the five, seven with the F in the bass, back to the C with the third in the bass, leading tone down here, come up our chords, but we're gonna go to the five chord and then A minor and D seven to G. So A minor and D seven to G. We see that as two, five, one, two, five, one. It tonicizes, it makes that five sound like it's a one chord, very important. But then Beethoven knows that, so he's gonna do a little chromatic motion and erase that F sharp with an F natural in the bass. That's why it sounds so beautiful. He's rearing here and then erases it. It just, it's so nicely done. The, if we're in the key of C, we think of seven tones, don't we? But Mozart, Haydn, and Beethoven, because they modulate to the five so often, they're gonna need another scale step. So if they're gonna to modulate to five, means we're gonna go from C major to G major. I'm thinking in terms of C. What's our leading tone of the five? In other words, if we're in the key of G major, if we're going to G major, what's our leading tone? That's the F sharp, isn't it? So we're probably gonna get this F sharp even though we're in the key of C. So we have a scale like this. But the F sharp is hidden in there. It's another tone, an accessory to the scale that we could pull out. Does that make any sense? Let me give you another example. We know about relative minor, don't we? What's the relative minor of C? A minor, okay, so that's easy. And we know we might have a leading tone. Oh, yes, that leading tone for the relative minor, right? G sharp. So even though I'm in the key of C, I may to A minor, and to get to A minor, I bring in that G sharp, you see? And if I went, so what we have then is the F sharp as an ancillary note to go to G, and a G sharp as an ancillary note to tonicize the relative minor. Isn't that cool? And then do you like the four chord? I kind of love the four chord. rock and roll sound and what Bach did often is because he'd go from one down to five into the next key section when he comes back toward the end of the piece he wants to go add the more board to go that down a fourth so down a fourth from one to five key of C to G at the very end often he'll go up to the four and pull the one so that B flat gives us a five of the four so what I've just done here is given meaning to that whole set of chromatic tones up at the top, depending on what key you want to go to from our key. I know that sounds kind of complicated, but we could do a little exercise on this that's kind of cool. We're in A flat. Okay, so let's say you were just talking about the E flat section, and we went from the one to the five. And then we went, um, uh, we went through here, five, seven, to the G flat. So we said, what tone do we need in our scale that is modified? What do we have in reserve to tonicize the five? The A flat is our one. Step five is E flat. So what's the leading tone of E flat? D natural. So. Go back to our score. Do we see a D natural in there? I bet we'll have one. And sure enough, right? Right there's the D natural because that points out the E flat. Now let's do something similar. We said relative minor is pretty important, isn't it? So what's the relative minor of A flat? We go down or three half steps. If you can't remember it or your students can't remember it, Give them a model. C major is related to A minor. Okay, to get from C to the relative minor is counting down three half steps. So we're in A flat. We're going to go one, two, three half steps. So everybody sees that, right? We have F minor. Okay, so F minor is a likely candidate. And it's so nice because it still fits under the hand. I don't care if I'm on an A flat or an F minor. It's the same. 
the mm. same scale feeling. But what sharp do we need to bring in to tonicize F minor? Uh, it's not a sharp really here that we're raising that E flat to an E natural. So without even looking at the piece, we probably said, well, it's an A flat, but there's probably going to be an accidental of D natural because we know it might move to the five. But we could also say there's probably going to be an accidental of an E natural on here. And why would we have that E natural on our scale? Because it's likely going to tonicize that relative minor. So let's scan our piece. We found our D natural right in the opening line, right in our opening theme. If we go forward, do you see any E natural coming up? Ah, there we go into our B section. There's the E natural right there, isn't it? Because it's the five of the relative minor. This B section is an F minor. So we're going to be walking that bass around. into that in a minute but it's kind of this magical sense of predicting what's going to happen because we can predict that the composer will likely tonicize or modulate to sometimes tonicize is same as modulation but more temporarily gives a five of the five to let it be more stable instead of unstable so that's going to be that leading tone for the five and then of course our natural our, our accidental that gives a leading tone of the relative minor so you can pull, play games with your students on that and close your eyes and predict what naturals will be in the B section and or sharp, what accidentals will be in the B section. They'll think you're a musical genius. Is it good for us to be a musical genius with our students? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, actually, it's a liability. Do you know why it's a liability? Because then they think they don't have talent. They don't realize that we've been playing for who knows how many decades, right? And when we put so many thousands and thousands of hours, we get pretty good at understanding harmony and things. And if a student's just started out and they're in their first hundred hours of practice, they can't begin to see the same way we do. So they think we have some incredible talent. But no, it's just, we just put in more time. So sometimes I try to hide or hold back and it's uh, of, what I can do or something at the keyboard for the student. I'll always demonstrate with exquisite artistry beauty because the student needs those models. They don't know what to aspire to. But it's okay if you're doing some improvisation and you're not really good at it. You're probably going to be a better teacher in some, well, I shouldn't say that totally, but in some ways you'd be a better teacher for motivating the student. Because if you're an incredible musical genius, you put in so much time and you just got the chops, the student will feel so intimidated that sometimes they bow out. But if they see you work at it, they see you digging in and struggle and finding it, then they can imitate that adventure, the exploration and the struggle and finding it. And their self-esteem is right intact because they feel that they can work at right just behind you of moving forward. It's an interesting counterpart to our intuition, I guess you could say. And of course we have, I'm sure in our audience here today, uh, across, we have the spectrum of familiarity. We probably have some really fine artists and some, um, you know, just outstanding teachers to be sure. And there's some students here too. And there are also some students who haven't had the chance to be as exposed in depth to musicology and uh, all the elements of music theory and counterpoint and so on. But that's okay. You can find the area that you're teaching well. And I'm highlighting here that if you're in the mode of exploration, doing deep analysis, you, can made, you just might be a better teacher than the one that has all the expertise, but discards the perspective of the student or overwhelms the perspective of the student. So my point is that whatever level you're at, if you show that intense interest and in digging in and finding, then you're modeling the approach for the students. And that's what we want our students to do is not to be dependent on the information we give them, but to start thinking like an artist and doing the hard work of digging in to find the sort of things we're talking about today. Does that, does that help to give a little bit of clarity? I think that was a wonderful tangent, maybe. <laughs> that was actually a really, even for me, you know, I'm somebody who's a pianist and I've taught piano for many, many years, but I've never thought of, you know, not being the expert all the time, you know, letting your students see you learning alongside. That's a really 
Yeah, it's Perfect pretty point. interesting. I've got a Kevin Landon, who's an incredible pianist, beautiful oh, playing, it's stunning. So um, remember with that, we always want to play with stunning beauty for the students, because one of the things that I think is overlooked often is the teachers teaching with words. And unfortunately, it's a little hard with the Skype lessons or Zoom lessons these days. But if we don't really play and demonstrate the artistry, the student doesn't get it in their ears. They don't have the models. So always uh, play with that exquisite beauty and the demonstrating and there's so much the student will imitate because the, the brain, there's, you know, the mirror neurons, you may have heard of that. It's a little bit of a controversial neurological or neuroscience issue, but there does seem to be certain area in the brain of neurons that are so closely tied to perceptions of visual and motor movement that just seeing someone else move in a way activates the same motor muscles ourselves. And kind of fascinating um, way to look at it, but it's actually that part of the brain that has the most mirror neurons is actually right next to the finger motor neurons. So that's kind of good for us as pianists. In wow. other words, there's an incredible ability to mirror right to the fingers. So when you demonstrate, the student is picking up almost intuitively through perceiving your motion, activating their own reciprocal motions, mirroring really. And that's a, a really vital part of teaching that we can miss. And sometimes if we sit back and we don't move and we don't demonstrate and we just start talking about beat three of measure 24 and that, can you add a little more arm weight on that or we need more staccato in the left hand. That, you know, that doesn't make it. Just showing it in, in, in sound will always give so much more uh, vital messaging and it just comes across so much more efficiently. Right. We do have two, two questions in the question box. We also have a, an attendee named Joyce Postmus who has raised her hands and uh, she was first actually. So I wonder, do you, do you feel like taking another? Yeah, Joyce is All right. Question. Thank you, Joyce, for, for your patience and for participating. Vote her to panelist. And I'll invite her on in just a moment here. Joyce. All right, let's see. There she is. Yeah, okay, wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Faber. I'm a great fan of you from Ontario, Canada. Very good. Um, so I, I joined a little later and I might have a question that's already been asked, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, in the C section, I'm always uh, amazed how he goes from uh, from his uh, flatter key to like a, like uh, the one with the sharps. So yeah. measure, measure five in the C section and measure six, the A flat minor chord and the B seven chord. Is that because they're enharmonically related that he can do that? It is. It's enharmonically related. It's a very good question. I think I'll take just a moment and dig into that. And um, let me see if I can bring up the score for everybody. Most may have a score here, but if I just see what, what I can grab here in, uh, in my scores, I'm going to just slide through a few things if you can. Oh boy, it's some good stuff. We'll come back to that. But if you can bear with me, I'm going to move right to more score here. Sorry, ignore that for now. So where are we here? Okay, here we are in the B section. We, we noted that that was in the relative minor, didn't we? One and five, seven. And the questions come up, and I noticed in the chat line there, someone else asked about um, measure 37. Let's see, so right here, if we're, can you see my mouse right there? Mm -hmm. This is our C section, isn't it? I'm in the third line down here, third measure in, where we see that A flat minor. So we have to pick up and and then uh, okay. So now, do I have more score? Maybe I do here. Oh, here we go. I've got the whole section here now. So thank you. We've, we've got the picking up where I left off. Um, and here's the part, and it 
That's a really intriguing question. And let's first identify the opening of the C section. We're startled at first with that C flat in there, right? But all it did is made it minor. And what minor chord did we choose, or did Beethoven choose? A flat minor? Yeah, A flat minor, so it's the parallel minor. So notice we went from A flat major, and then the section B episode, we were in the relative minor, and then we had our A section again, and now he goes to the parallel minor. So, okay, so we're in the key of A flat minor. That's our one chord. What's our five, seven? Still E flat seven again, isn't it? So we have one, and here's our five, seven. startling one. Now, let's look first melodically. Okay, that's our tonic, our step one, up to the minor third and two, and we went to leading tone to four. Those pull that. So it's beautifully done in, in the arpeggiatura uh, over the leading tone. Now, yeah, it doesn't sound so out now, does it? We notice that A flat just steps down to a G flat. And if it was a G flat, it wouldn't feel so out of, out of shape, really, because it would just be in our natural minor A flat. But because it's F sharp, it looks so odd as an F sharp seven, doesn't it? Okay, now let's dig in a little bit. Uh, first of all, just on a surface level, it's a B7 chord, right? Which is five seven of what? Was B seven is five of E, and he just went with the seventh in the bass here to resolve half step down to the third of the E, and then he does jumps to an F sharp seven, which is five of what? B. B. So we'd expect B, but he does a little more cane to the one six four five seven one. So here's what I see going on. For one to the leading tone and here he's going to give a more emotion by getting rid of the leading tone but he harmonizes it here which would normally um, a resolve here okay and then we get the f sharp and to the b let's take a look at if we're in a flat minor i know we that's parallel minor but let's just say we started out in a flat minor What's the relative major of that? And maybe we can think a little more clearly. If we think A flat minor, you know, that's got a heck of a lot of flats in there. I can hardly count them. So I think at least seven, right? So if we go to sharps instead as a G sharp minor, it's a little easier to grasp, isn't it? How many sharps in G sharp minor? Uh, five. Five, yeah. So let's go up three half steps to find the relative major. Uh, B major, that's the relative major. So now is it any surprise that he went to a B chord? And then the five seven of the B, and you kind of think it's gonna be there, but he didn't quite do that. He went on and tonicized E instead. So granted, we thought that maybe he was, he was just gonna go to the relative major, but he went a little, he went a little outside of that, kind of like um, the ballad in G minor does that too. He goes to a five, seven, one, but then keeps going. He imitates it again at a higher point. He goes a five of the five to the five. And that's what he's doing here. We have a five, seven, one, and then the five of the five and ends in E instead. It's a little complex, but think of, is E very far away? A flat? minor up to the B is relative major, but A flat minor down to E is just down a third the other way. 
let's go, let's make it simple. We have to go to a key, a key we know, right? So should we go to A minor? We all know A minor well. So, so we have da di di da do, da di di da right? And then it goes down to here, it goes down. And this kind of makes sense, isn't it? Because what's the relative major of A minor? C. Um, so it's no, it's no surprise that it goes to the C chord, right? But notice here, we didn't actually go to the relative minor. Instead, we went the other way, we went down the third. So he's tonicizing the key of F instead. And these are wonderful pairing. If you take pop music, we could go up a third, but sometimes we go down a third. That down a third in minor is very rich, isn't it? Yeah. It's very rich. And so in an, it, it's very likely that we could go then to that E major or we can go to the B either way from that G sharp minor. And I believe that the reason why Beethoven chose the E is because in context, remember this is an episode and if you were with us last session on Wednesday, we said the episode gets out of the ordinary. It's gonna venture forth and with some pathos, right? But it's gonna go somewhere. We're gonna get more drama. And a big gains. And now let's do the same thing, but in, on the E in major. So we've got the root, third, two, and leading tone. And we'll repeat it again. But now. Five, seven, one. We talked about the episode working through a transition where it evolves back to flowing into the one. It's usually not a dramatic entrance of one, but flowing into it. So he's going through the E flat seven, the five seven, isn't he? Mm -hmm. And we know this E, e chord is just is that closely related to that E flat in the minor key. Beautifully. So that E isn't so much that it's come out of where we were, it does do that nicely, but also sets up to go to where he wants to go next, that E flat seven. Because we're on step, pulling down a half step to five, one. Is he, does that yeah. make any sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. thank you. So it's not so much of where he's at at the moment, but he's there at the moment because that can take him where he wants to go next. It's mm -hmm. almost like a beautiful halfway point, if you will. In fact, it's on a median sort of tone, isn't it? A third away from that A flat and then sliding to the five and one. So it's, a, it's, it's quite marvelously, marvelously done. Let's see if we can put a few, some, oh my gosh, I can't believe that we're so far along and running out of time here. But we're already past our house. <laughs> <laughs> Randy, I, I just wanted to check. You know, we've got, we've got a couple other webinars scheduled next Wednesday and Friday at 1130. We do have a couple more questions, but would you prefer to answer them at the next session? Or, or do you want to, I mean. Well, I'll tell you what, let's take one more question, shall we? And then we'll close off. And I, I do want to, I, you had a sneak peek at some charts there that I passed. I've got some really good elements here that can help us give clarity to what we talked about today because it's not surprising that especially when we're in the key of a flat minor it's no wonder that our heads can get a little befuddled in all this so we want to get simplicity and clarity so at the next session uh we're going to talk about variation and then we're going to talk about the development so we can dig into these harmonies a little bit more but i will try to share with you some tools they're actually in scale book three that just came out that really help the students see with clarity these one and five sevens in the major and relative minor. And I'd like to have a chance to 
address that so that this is crystal clear for you because I know it's fuzzy. It's always fuzzy the first time. Some of you grasp it fully, of course, but it's not, don't feel bad if you don't grasp at all because it just means you have to have more practice with it. We need more digging in, more familiarity. And there are tools that'll take us there because we're into some nice meaty repertoire. Granted, it's a slow movement, it's an accessible movement, but it doesn't mean that the harmony is really simple. So we need stairways, steps to be able to get to that deeper understanding. I'd like to help walk you through that path. For now, Landon, yes, let's go to another question and then we'll close off for today. Yeah, sure. So Chris Morrow asked a really great juicy question. Okay. I'm up Would you that. please go over how to play the pedal correctly with notes that are staccato or have accents oh, yeah. such as in measure seven and eight? That's a great question. We're talking about the transition. We And just a little preview, we're going to talk on the about three sessions coming up. We're going to dig into all of the touch and the sound and the artistry. And I'm hoping that I can get uh, my camera switcher and get multiple cameras. If I'm hoping for that session, I'll have a camera on the pedal. And so we'll be able to talk about that with a lot of specificity. So please come back for that final session in the series. But as a quick little preview, you, because it's all A flat, there's a temptation to want to pedal through, but Beethoven marks the staccato. So how are we going to do it? Well, do it kind of an in between, shake the pedal out, and at the very minimum, give a completely clean pedal on that eighth rest. So after the first arpeggiations, we have to have a new pedal here. And I don't know if you could hear that, but my pedal is only just a featherweight down. So. I get not only that change of pedal, but it's an incomplete pedal. Or you can also, you can go pedal, 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 just super fast. You don't want to lose the tones of the other chords because if you do complete on the other tones, I think it's, it breaks it if it's all staccato. So a little bit of feathery pedal with that change on that second beat will give you just the right sound. It sounds detached and yet it, it, uh, connects it in a melodic fashion. Remember that Beethoven loved legato. And I know that can be startling because we see so many articulations in his writing, which is characteristic of the period. And those articulations we want to observe. But default for Beethoven was legato. It was his favorite sort of touch, even though he used so many staccatos in the writing. Isn't that kind of a dichotomy? And I think the reason for that is that Beethoven was always interested in where am I going and where's that musical line shaping. And so that's where the little touch of the pedal, little featheriness there can carry the harmony through and help us lead with direction to where we're going. So that direct answer is a pedal change on that second eighth note and just a very feathery light pedal there that gives a slight wash, but you'll still hear the separation of your staccatos from the fingers. Okay, excellent question. And uh, think of more. I tell you what, just collect your questions. I wish I could have gotten to more today, but we've got a number of sessions yet coming up. This is only number two out of several. And I look forward to digging in more with you next time. Sound good, everybody. Thank you very much for joining and our apologies for the server issues. We're just so glad that you could connect. And uh, if you did miss part of it because of logging in, oh, we'll try to make sure we have a video available to you. Okay, take care, stay safe, and I will see you next week.